Uh, what I'm going to do is before I actually start the uh, lecture, I'm going to give a couple of uh, comments about the structure of the day. So the theme for today is numerical algebraic geometry. And the schedule is, you know, roughly the same as yesterday. I have uh, my two lectures, again, 65 minutes. And the 65 minutes seemed to work well because it really gave time for questions. I really encourage people to ask questions. You know, don't be shy because basically this is a kind of a conference where we really learn a lot from each other. So, so please uh, continue doing that. Uh, then after lunch, uh, John will uh, talk about some, you know, sort of more recent kinds of things in numerical algebraic geometry. And then at uh, 3.30, we have the software demo. And here's the, uh, some of the software that's going to be featured in the software demo. And the way it's going to be uh, structured is that John will start off, tell us a little bit about Bertini. Then uh, Jose will tell us about Macaulay 2 and uh, Bertini.m2. So I assume that's an interface between the two programs. Uh, then there's the Bertini Reel that Danielle's going to tell us about. And then Margaret will tell us about uh, uh, Polytop. Also, yesterday we had a wonderful poster session that I really enjoyed all the posters. I thank everyone that uh, contributed a poster. And it turns out that some of the posters are directly relevant to some of the lectures, and so I'm going to mention those. And so it turns out there's actually four of the posters are relevant to stuff that's happening today. Because, for example, uh, Simon's poster, that's not his title. This is sort of uh, what we're going to be seeing is the relevant thing, is that when you have this uh, quotient ring, if you're going to do numerical calculations, you need a really good basis. He's going to talk about what happens uh, when they all have the same Newton uh, po polytope. And so I'm going to talk about a special case of that, and um, which is sort of a first paper that Simon did. This is sort of based on a second paper. Then, uh, and James has a poster, because one of the themes we're going to see in the, in the second lecture today is homotopy continuation. And James has a poster on how to use homotopy continuation to find certain uh, pr critical parameter values in systems of polynomial equations. Uh, also, in the second lecture today, I'm going to talk about uh, witness sets. And they'll be basically project witness sets in projective space or affine space. Jose has a poster on sort of a multi-projective version of that that's useful in some contexts. And, uh, and then Margaret has a poster on Polytop, which is also going to be featured in the software demo. And so you know, that, this is part of why we're leaving the posters up. And so when you see you know, something relevant in, in a lecture that relates to a poster, you can go back and check out the poster and, and bug the person that uh, actually wrote the poster and say, you know, what's really going on here? So to actually get started today, let's see. First thing I want to do is turn on the sound so you can hear me. I apologize. So as I said, the theme today is uh, numerical algebraic geometry. And sort of the first lecture was really just thinking about what can you do when you combine that with linear algebra. But it turns out that uh, before we do that, uh, I basically want to give some very introductory examples just to sort of introduce some of the challenges that happen when you do algebraic geometry with this funny thing called a floating point number. It uh, behaves w in, in interesting ways. Then I'll simply talk about some very classical interactions between linear algebra and algebraic geometry. So this part of the talk, uh, there's the finiteness theorem. We'll talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Here I'm going to assume that we're in the land of sort of knowing everything. But then we're going to basically try to combine some of this with some of the uh, sort of the uh, numerical analysis and really get into sort of the num numerical linear algebra and systems of equations. I'll talk about uh, the condition number of a matrix. And then actually, we'll see two uh, substantial examples. And so the first one, example one, th th that's basically the, the predecessor to this work of uh, Simons. And then the second is uh, an, a project on algebraic oil. That, and we'll see what that actually means. And, uh, and the caution is I am extremely extremely naive when it comes to numerical matters. When I, in my training, I never took numerical analysis. I never took differential equations. I never took statistics. Uh, and, and, and we'll see. So there's, so I've, I'm coming to this as a complete newbie. And, uh, and so in particular, there are people in the audience that know vastly much more about this than I do. So I apologize in advance for some of the embarrassing things that I might say. And, and if I do say something really embarrassing, correct me. I mean, be gentle, but, but correct. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. 
And so, and so the idea is that you know, in classical algebraic geometry, that's my training, is uh, you know, the coefficients in a system of equations, they're arbitrary, but somehow they're still exact. You know, the coefficient is this. And the solutions, well, they might be unknown, but when they exist, you know, it's an exact solution. You know, we do plug it in, you get exact zero. And in fact, plugging in is evaluation, and when you plug in, the answer is exact. So that, that's the world that I was trained in and uh, thought about. In numerical algebraic geometry, the coefficients can be sort of approximate, the solutions are approximate, and when you, uh, if you plug a solution in to your uh, system of equations, well, it won't be zero. And so, so the evaluation is no longer exact. And so what I want to do is give two pretty simple examples to illustrate some of the complications that can arise. And so the first one is just the binomial theorem. And this is an example from uh, Van Loan's book, Introduction to Scientific Computing. So you take x minus 1 to the 6, you expand it out by the binomial theorem, you get that. But then there's also uh, what's called the Horner method of uh, sort of trying to write the polynomial efficiently from the point of view of multiplication. And so algebraically, these guys are the same. Now, one thing to think about is that this one right here, notice that to compute this, you know, I subtract, I multiply, I add, I multiply, I subtract, I multiply. This is actually a very nice example of a straight line program. You just boom, 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 you're done. And, uh, and the idea is that, again, algebraically they're the same, mathemat but numerically they aren't. And so what I did is I, I used Mathematica, and basically uh, when, I, when you do this kind of thing, you know, n means a numerical approximation that says work to 16 decimal places. So I took these three identical expressions, uh, you know, made these three functions that are those, you know, evaluated numerically to 16 decimal places. And then I took this particular interval, and uh, uh, about one, and I took 200 equally spaced inputs, and I just plugged those uh, 200 inputs into these functions, again using the 16 digits of, in, of precision, and just plot it. And, and here are the graphs I got. And so, you know, this one is sort of what I expected. This one's a real mess, and this one's less of a mess. And of course, part of what's going on is that here I have a zero, you know, one is a zero of very high multiplicity. And I'm working right near that zero. So you sort of expect things might go a little haywire. And of course, this is the one that works the best. You know, this one, where you, I try to minimize the number of multiplication, you know, that one is a little better, but still not great. And of course, this one, which is, you know, the, just the classical binomial theorem, is, is a complete mess. And so that's the thing is that, you know, in, in my world, these should be the same. In the numerical world, they aren't. So, so I guess the problem is all the addition. Yeah, the cancellation and the addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, so, so like I say, it's, it's a complicated thing. So then what I did was I said, well, let's up the precision. And so I took G. Remember, G was the worst one. So, so G is, you know, th this one in the middle that's, uh, you know, just the, the pure binomial theorem. And, uh, and I, just, I just went from 16 to 26. I did the exact same thing, and it now looked better. And so this is the idea is that if you up the precision, even though, you know, at one precision it might be bad, at a higher precision it can actually work nicely. And one of the things that happens <coughs> in numerical analysis in general and in numerical algebraic geometry is that there's often cases where you have to increase the precision, but here I did it by an ad hoc process. You know, I used 16, really was terrible. I tried 20, it still looked pretty bad. I tried 26, hey, it looked pretty good. And that's not how you do it on a computer. And so the computer has to be smart enough to figure out, A, that I need more precision, and B, how much more do I need? So this is the idea that of adaptive precision. And, and so basically all the software that does the numerical stuff has to be have this kind of smart parts in it. Now it turns out that here part of what we're talking about is sort of the uh, tension between arithmetic and geometry. And, uh, and it turns out that uh, this tension's been around for a long time. If you uh, look at the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, so he died not quite 500 years ago. And uh, here's his comment. Arithmetic is a computational science in its calculation with true and perfect units but it's of no avail when dealing with continuous quantity. And that's the tension we're facing here. That, you know, we're trying to compute with real numbers, complex numbers, those are really intrinsically continuous quantities. And yet, 
we've got to do this arithmetic. And so the you know, floating point numbers are this compromise of trying to bridge the gap. And it's an imperfect compromise. But you know, it's at least a way of trying to r wrap your head around it. And, uh, and basically, that's really the goal of a numerical analysis, to bridge this gap between sort of the arithmetic and, and the geometry. And, uh, and it turns out that that's also really the goal of numerical algebraic geometry, is make arithmetic work in algebraic geometry, because you basically have to combine the algebra with the numerical analysis in a way avoid some of the strange things we saw in, in, in that first example. Now, a second example is uh, one where I, I, I Lagrange multipliers problem. So this is an example in ideals varieties algorithms, because in the in the second chapter we wanted to give some examples of uh, sort of what you could do with uh, you know you know we wanted something that could relate well to what students knew. And you know, we wrote this book for undergraduates. So undergraduates, of course, had done Lagrange multipliers and multivariable calculus. So we wanted a Lagrange multipliers problem. And of course, you know, the ones that they see in multivariable calculus are always these artificial ones where you, know, you can, you know, by, you know, you basically it's always got a very small number of solutions that you can sort of find just by basically farting around. And, um, and so I wanted something that would show that you had to do, that I wanted something slightly more realistic. And so, so, the, so I, I just tried something. I, I just wrote down, you know, I, I wanted to keep it with the sphere, because you know, that's typical of what students would see. And so my objective function that I want to you know, minimize or maximize, I just made it slightly more complicated. And I don't actually remember why I picked that one. I just sort of wrote it down and tried it. And so when you do the Lagrange stuff, you know, here's the partials of one is lambda times the partials of the other. I also have to satisfy the constraint. And you know, I want to, you know, basically, uh, I'm going to do a Lex Grobner basis because that'll do the elimination very nicely, and. Uh, and, and so, so, I, so when I tell students, if I'm teaching a course in this, I say, well, you know, we want to simplify this system. And so I'm going to simplify the system by doing a Grobner basis, and then I show them this slide, <laughs> and and they, and they say that's simpler, and the answer is yes, this is simpler. Because if you look at the very bottom equation, you know, it just involves z. You know, that's part of the elimination theorem. And it, I actually know what the z roots are. And then, you know, then the next few just involve <coughs> z and y. So I can, you know, back, in a sense, I can back substitute like they did in linear algebra, and I can solve the system. So this crazy thing actually is simpler. Well, see, that's the thing. I was just lucky. <laughs> I, I tried it, and it worked. And so what's interesting is what that means is that compared to the real world, this is still an artificial example. Because in the real world, when you get some seventh degree polynomial by elimination, it is not going to turn into something like this. That's right. So it's you know so, so somehow something very nice happened here. This is sort of the perfect intermediate spot to convince students there's something going on, and yet you don't want to plunge directly into the you know numerics. And so you, this is still partly the world they recognize of what they can do. But then I decided, well, let's actually think numerically. And so you know, here's my objective function. So I decided just for fun to take that coefficient and just tweak it a bit. So I changed it to 2.1. And uh, it turns out in the polynomial in Z, now previously it had degree 7, but when I do this little tweak, all of a sudden it has degree 9. I pick up two extra roots. And so, you know, so in fact some of the roots are completely unchanged. 0 and plus or minus 1 are still roots. And then one of the roots is this guy. Well, but when I had just equal to 2, a root was plus or minus 2 thirds of that, and those guys are pretty close. And then another root is this one. Well, it turns out one of the exact roots, again, this one comes from the 2.1. When I do this one for 2, again, they're you know, a little further apart. But then I get two completely, uh, this is, I, I was not expecting this. And all of a sudden, I get these imaginary roots that are large, you know, 14, almost 50. And so I said, well, well I probably went too far away from two. So, so let's try a little closer, and then I should get something that's better. And so I, I, I tried 2.01. I still got nine roots. And notice that you know, here these guys are closer. You know, here's the 0.666. Here's 0.665. You know, here this one's 0.293. This is 295. So these guys are getting closer. And this guy got 10 times larger. And so I realized 
what the heck is going on? And the answer is, I have a pair of roots going to infinity. And so what happens is that when I have this one, my system actually has some roots at infinity. But if I jigger it slightly, all of a sudden they show up in affine space. And that's one of the problems you encounter when you deal with these approximate coefficients. You know, if you somehow miraculously know that your answer is that it's two, uh, then, uh, th then you don't have these, uh, these guys to worry about. But if you just know you're somewhere close to two, then you really have, you have a decision to make. You have to say that, well, I'm either going to accept these roots, <coughs> or you're going to say I'm looking at this system the wrong way. I really have to think projectively to really understand the system. And so, and so these, these are some of the kind of decisions that have to be made when you're working with sort of approximate roots. Yeah, this, this is a nice illustration of, so Bernstein's theorem is proof of the lemma. His lemma is, is if you have fewer solutions to a sparse system than you expect, there has to be a solution at, at, at infinity. Right. In the case of the spatial system. Right. This is sort of a good illustration. That's right. And so, and, and so then to think about sort of this approximate coefficient, let's just make this uh, just a constant number C. And then, then here's my system now. Now it depends on this parameter, C. And then, you know, C equals 2 is, uh, you know, that's the one we started with. And, and, then, he, and then here, uh, and then what happens is that so far I've, in the previous slides, I just focused on the Z coordinates. But when you chase through the whole system, C equals 2 gives 10 solutions. 2.1 and 2.01 give 12 solutions. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, here, these extra two solutions are the ones going to infinity as C approaches 2. And so, so what are some models for approximate coefficients? And so... Uh, and this is not a complete list, but you know some people use what's called interval arithmetic. You pick an interval about it, and then you try to manipulate the intervals in some way. Uh, there's this uh, fuzzy stuff that uh, you know you basically sort of think of uh, as some sort of distribution of what the C's could be. You know, at uh, you know the probability of you know here the, somehow the probability is one, but it drops off nearby. Now Stetter has this interesting book, Numerical Polynomial Algebra, published by Siam. Uh, a while ago, and Stetter has sort of a very uh, hands-on idea. He, he talks about empirical uh, 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 coefficients, he, and he doesn't really want to assign explicit probability distributions. He wants to sort of back away from that, but he says that so, you know, he would say something like, C is equal to 2 within, you know, plus or minus 0.01. So he'd say that, you know, this is likely to happen. That's still possible, you know, when I sort of, you know, go a little further away. But, you know, that's unlikely. And, and so, but he kept it as a very sort of almost qualitative way of thinking about stuff. And then the, when you think about the Samizi Wampler stuff, which is the approach that, uh, Bertini takes, you simply regard this as a parameter. And then often to solve things, and what happens is that there's a generic behavior, which is 12 solutions. And then uh, and what happens is that, and, and we'll actually see this in the second lecture, is that what you do is you can first solve it generically and do that, and, and, and then you can use homotopy continuation to get down to a specific value that you have. And then in that case, you would actually, in a sense, the homotopy, these solutions really would go to infinity in the homotopy continuation. And, and so that's sort of some introduction to sort of some of the numerical stuff. And uh, now I'm going to go and actually uh, just do some very classical algebraic geometry for a while. And it's the part that interacts most nicely with linear algebra. And so uh, one of my favorite results is what's called the finiteness theorem. So the idea is that you have an ideal in a polynomial ring, and, you know, and here's some equivalent conditions. So you want the variety of the ideal to be finite. So basically, you call that a zero-dimensional ideal. And then the question is, what does that mean algebraically? And what it means algebraically, again, because we're over an algebraically closed field, that just says that when I look at the quotient ring and think of that as a vector space, it has finite dimension. And so here, this is just vector space dimension. And then you can also detect it from a, a, a Grubner basis, because basically for every i, for each variable, there's an element in the Grubner. So you have some Grubner basis. So this is a there exists. So there exists a Grubner basis where for every variable, there's an element of the Grubner base whose leading term is the power of that variable. 
And then it turns out that when that's true, then every possible reduced Grobner basis has this property. So this gives an algorithmic method for detecting uh, whether or not you have, uh, have finitely many solutions over the complex numbers. But what's also nice is that in this situation, you actually get a, so this is a finite dimensional vector space. If you want to do computations, it helps to have a basis, and this method actually produces a basis, because what you do is you simply take all monomials that aren't leading terms, and it turns out there's finitely many, and there's easy methods for actually determining this. And it turns out this set of monomials, it's a, what's sometimes called an order ideal, and what that means is a set of monomials that's closed under a factor. So if I have, if I have some x to the alpha, that's not in here, and if I have any divisor of it, uh, then that divisor also can't be in here. So any time a monomial's in here, all of its divisors are. And that gives a certain structure to the, uh, uh, to, to be, in it. I, if you've ever looked at books on combinatorial uh, you know, algebraic geometry, you'll see these staircase diagrams that basically are order ideals. And so, you, so the idea is that in this situation, not only can you detect finiteness, you actually get a basis. And so that's, that's really nice. And so again, just the terminology is, uh, you know, when I, even this happens, it's a zero dimensional ideal. So that's zero dimensional as an algebraic variety, which means that, you know, this guy has finite dimension as a vector space. And then of course, these are called the remainder monomials because they're the ones that show up in remainders under the division algorithm. And of course, this whole set right here is called an order ideal. It's not just the basic terminology. Now, a really nice thing is that this guy is more than just a vector space. It's also a ring, because it's a quotient ring. And so if I take an element of the polynomial ring, I can basically look at a multiplication map where I take, a, I take an element of the, of the quotient ring. So that's, this is the coset of the polynomial G. And I just map this to the uh, coset of F times G. And you can uh, check easily that that's so well-defined. If you ever teach a course in uh, abstract algebra, that's a good exercise or test problem to give your students, prove that this is well-defined. And, um, and it turns out it's also uh, actually a linear map. And so I get a linear map from a finite dimensional vector space to itself. And in fact, of course, I get a lot of them. So in fact, I have a commuting family of linear maps. So it's, it's a nice, it's, it's a very nice structure. And then uh, what's called the eigenvalue theorem, that uh, I, I first saw it in the paper of Lazard in 1980. I've heard it attributed to Stickleberger in the 1920s, but I've never been able to trace down the reference. So that's. I've got the same problem. And, 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 and so that's going to be one of my projects when I actually try to write this up in the book to see can I actually find something of Stickleberger that actually looks vaguely like this. And um, so if anybody knows anything about this, uh, definitely let me know. But anyway, what the eigenvalue theorem says is. Uh, so we're in this situation, I have this. So here is uh, our multiplication map, this nice linear map. It'll have eigenvalues. And the point is the eigenvalues are simply when I take this uh, polynomial f and I just evaluate it at the points of the variety. So that's a really great theorem. That, uh, so what that says is the eigenvalues of this thing are related to solutions. So in particular, if I take my f to just be the ith uh, the variable xi, well, when I apply xi to p, I just get the ith coordinate. So the, that says that if I look at this multiplication map by one of the variables, I just get that coordinate of the solutions. And so all of a sudden, I've turned solving a system of equations into an eigenvalue problem. So that's really nice. And so let me give an example. And so, uh, and so here I'm going to use Lex order with x greater than y, and then here's my three polynomials. I've highlighted the leading terms in red, and it turns out this is actually a, Gr a Grobner basis uh, for the ideal that these polynomials generate. And, um, and so let's apply the finiteness theorem to just how does it work in this case. And so first of all, notice that a leading term is x squared, a leading term is y squared. So each variable shows up as a pure power in one of the leading terms. So I have an instant proof that there are uh, finitely many solutions. And also, I, when I look at all the, the remainder monomials, are simply the guys that aren't divisible by any of these. And so it turns out you can easily check there's exactly uh, five of them. So that means that this ring has dimension five. And then also, it's an easy result uh, to show that this means there are at most five solutions. And, uh, and in fact, there are, another way to say it is that there, there are five solutions counting multiplicity. 
And uh, although in this case, we'll see that there are some multiplicities. And, uh, and, and so that's the finite theorem. It's really very powerful. I get information almost immediately about the solutions of this equation. And so let's actually work out the multiplication matrices. And so the idea is that, for example, uh, what's mx? Well, so what is, uh, I'm multiplying by x. So I, when I multiply by x, it maps 1 to x. So I basically, so remember this column is what happens to 1, and it basically maps to the fourth uh, basis vector, so I just get a 1 there. Also, when I take the second column, that's when I multiply, uh, basically when I multiply uh, x times y, and of course I just get the fifth one that's there. So this is where the first interesting thing happens. So in this column right here, I take y squared and I multiply it by x. So the question is, when I multiply this by x, why do I get a 1 there? And the answer is, remember, this is one of my polynomials in, in the Grobner basis. And so notice when I multiply y squared by x, I get this. But because that's in the ideal, these give the same coset. And that's one of my basis elements, the last one there. And it turns out the other entries in all the matrices are equally easy to figure out. And so now let's uh, <clears throat> compute eigenvalues. That's just an easy characteristic polynomial computation. And so, and so notice that in this matrix, it's a characteristic polynomial is u to the fifth, so the only eigenvalue is zero. So all the solutions have x coordinate equal to zero. And then when I look at uh, my, its characteristic polynomial is this, so 0 and 1 are the only eigenvalues. So that means the only possible y coordinates are 0 and 1. And so that means that for these guys, remember x is the only possible uh, x coordinate. So in fact, those are the solutions, and I've done it completely by linear algebra. So that's sort of the power of, uh, of this particular method. It really can give you the solutions. Now, in this particular case, it was easy to sort of figure out how the x-coordinates and y-coordinates fit together because there was only one possible x-coordinate. What do you do in general? And so one way to uh, match coordinates, so if, you know, if I have a potential x-coordinate and a potential y-coordinate, are they part of the same solution or part of different solutions? So how do I sort that out? And so one way to do it is to realize that these multiplication uh, uh, maps uh, commute, therefore the matrices commute, and that means I can find simultaneous eigenvectors. And so when I find, so basically, and this is true for all ij, so when I find something that's a simultaneous eigenvector for all the multiplication maps, then the corresponding eigenvalues give me a solution. And so, so that's one way to do it, but also sometimes Another approach is you can use left eigenvectors. Because remember when, I, when you talk about, you know, in linear algebra, when you do the, the usual thing, of, you know, talking about uh, the eigenvalues of a matrix, basically the, uh, you know, the, the vector uh, appears on the right side of the matrix. But you can also talk about left eigenvectors where it appears on the left side. And that's, a, that's equivalent to a right eigenvector for the transpose. But a matrix and a transpose have the same eigenvalues. And so that means I can exploit that. And so here's what's called the eigenvector theorem. And so this was uh, you know, the first reference I'm aware of is Ausinger and Stetter in 1988. But again, I've heard this vaguely attributed to Stickelberger. So again, I hope to chase that down. And what it says is that uh, suppose, suppose that's my monomial basis uh, of the quotient ring. And suppose I have a solution. Well, what I do is I take this monomial basis and I evaluate it at the solution. And then if I multiply it by the, uh, and again, this is multiplying on, so here I'm tr really treating this as a genuine row vector, and I multiply that row vector by the matrix, then what I get is just the, uh, again, the value of the function on P just times the, the same row vector. And so this says that this row vector is a left eigenvector for that eigenvalue. So this is another proof that uh, that's actually a, 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 a I, eigenvalue of uh, MF, and, uh, and then what happens is that in really nice cases, so suppose that F takes distinct values on the, uh, on the solutions, and suppose that 
MF is what's called a non-derogatory matrix that has several characterizations. It means the minimal polynomial is the characteristic polynomial. It means all the eigenspaces are one-dimensional. A couple of ways to think about it. It means all your solutions are simple. That's right. And well, actually, no. You you can have singular solutions. And, and simple distribution. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then you can have what are called curvilinear singularities, and, and you'll see that in a second. Okay, okay. And uh, and uh, and then it turns out that what this does. Because what non-derogatory means is that basically each Jordan block, for each eigenvector, there's a unique Jordan block, and that, that and that's why there's a uh, that's why the eigenspaces are one-dimensional. And, and and so then what happens in this nice situation is this actually gives, right here, I've actually written down the full set of uh, eigenvectors up to scalar multiplication, and so here's an example. So it turns out. You can actually check that that's actually, in this particular case, this is a non-derogatory matrix. And so that means there really are only two uh, eigenvectors. It turns out the eigenvalues are 0 and 3. And, and of course, when I, you write down an eigenvector, you know, like in this case, you only know it up to a scalar multiple. But what I do is I rescale it so the first uh, component is 1. And then you realize that this guy has to be that guy. So, what this has to be is, is it has to be these guys evaluated at a solution. But notice that this list of uh, uh, monomials includes y and x. So that is y evaluated at the solution. That's x evaluated solution. So that says the solution is 0, 0. Similarly, for this one, this has to be um, the solution evaluated at uh, y and the solution evaluated at x. And so. Um, Oh, that, that, the x is there because it's the fourth one. So I get the, the 0 and the 1. So I get my two solutions, but now I can read them off the eigenvectors. And so, so I don't have to go through this sort of simultaneous uh, uh, <coughs> sort of diagonalization to sort of do the matching in this particular case. And, and so, so there's a really a very pretty classical theory about how eigenvectors and eigenvalues interact with, uh, with the solutions of a system of equations. So, so, that's, so this is this lovely classical theory. And, uh, but now the question is, what happens when this meets numerical linear algebra? And then so, so let's spend some time exploring that. And so, so the idea is that, you know, certainly, I, I hope I've convinced you that linear algebra can help us solve these zero-dimensional di zero polynomial systems. But of course, if you have approximate solutions and approximate coefficients, you're clearly going to need numerical linear algebra to really get your hands on what's going on. And so let me just do a couple of things. So the norm I'm going to use is just you know, the, the classic uh, sort of L2 norm for CN. And then I'll use the, sort of the corresponding L2 matrix norm. For, for, so for a N by N matrix, I just you know, basically take the, you know, the, the unit sphere. And, and basically, I, I look at the maximum distortion caused by the uh, matrix. And so that's the matrix norm I'm going to use. And then if I use this matrix norm, and if my matrix is invertible, then then there's a condition number that basically tells you about the difficulty of solving a linear system. And in this situation, the condition number is just the norm of the matrix times the norm of its inverse. And that's always greater than or equal to 1. And so two examples are if my matrix is unitary, well, there's no length distortion. And so you know, the norm is 1. And so in fact, Unitary means the condition number is one, and so basically, a, a, you know, a, a system with unit, a unitary coefficient system, that's sort of perfectly conditioned. That's sort of as good as it gets in, in this particular framework. But then, a classic example of a poorly conditioned matrix is the four by four Hilbert matrix, where you basically the the ijth entry is one over i plus j. So it's just you basically get all these nice little fractions where the denominators just sort of grow nicely as you go deeper into the matrix, and, um, and so here's this little simple 4x4 four four matrix, and its condition number is about 15,000. So, that, that, so all of a sudden, you can get a very bad system of equations to solve. <coughs> and so this is something you have to be aware of uh, when you do numerical linear algebra. And of course, also condition numbers play a role in uh, numerical algebraic geometry, because you know, if you're trying to you know, solve a system of equations, you might have some Jacobian matrix. And well, it might be invertible, but 
but it's a condition number and that can tell you something about how hard it is at that particular point to solve things. So these condition numbers are definitely an important part of the, uh, uh, of the language. So now let me, I'm going to finish off on two substantial examples. And so the first one is the idea of, uh, I call it generic multiplication maps, and the generic actually has to do with the polynomials. And so what I'm going to do is pick uh, two polynomials in, uh, in two variables, and I want them to be just generic of degree d. That in this case, it turns out we actually know everything. We, know the, we actually know the basis, we know the multiplication maps, and we get it for free without any Grobner bases or anything. So, so that's the power of this generic situation. So the idea is that what happens in this case is that uh, you're, you could take the basis of just all monomials where in each degree it's bounded by a d minus 1. And, and so notice that there are d squared uh, uh, possibilities here. And so, so this quotient ring has a dimension d squared. And, uh, and of course this is another example of an order ideal. And then, of course, if you think about this system has, uh, you know, it has d-squared solutions. And again, because it's generic, the solutions are all in C2. And again, that's uh, Bazou's theorem. And, uh, and so what happens, of course, all these solutions have multiplicity 1. And, uh, and so that's why, you know, the d-squared here and the d-squared of that dimension match up perfectly. And so, so this is a very nice uh, situation. But now the question is, how do I compute the multiplication matrices? So, so, so let's explore that. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to let t be uh, 2d minus 1. And then what I do is I take f and g, and I multiply them by monomials of total degree d minus 1. And, and so, so x to the i, y to the j has d, total degree less than or equal to 2d minus 1. This has degree d. So each of these products has degree at most t. And, uh, and so then I expand it. And here there's a typo in the slide, because I, I want to express this in terms of monomials of degree less than or equal uh, to, to, uh, to t. And, uh, and, and then what I do is that's going to be a matrix. And this is going to be like one of these Macaulay-style matrices that we talked about last time. But I'm going to order things so that I put the columns of b last. And so here's an example, and I took this example, so this is a paper of, uh, that Simon did with his advisor, Van Barrel, in 2017. And, uh, and so basically, this is a very simple case, you know, it's just two uh, uh, quadratics, and so, you know, there's four points of intersection, and our, you know, little monomial basis of the quotient ring just has, uh, you know, those four uh, monomials in it. And what we're going to see is I'm going to work out the multiplication matrices in just directly from um, this right here. And so let, let's do that in detail. So what I want to do is I want to take F and G and multiply them by certain things. So what do I multiply them by? Well, remember I multiply them by mon monomials x to the i, y to the j of total degree less than or equal to d minus 1. And of course, in this case, d is 2. And so that means that uh, x to the i, y to the j has degree at most 1. And so, so that's why this is really I just multiply by 1, x, and y. And I do the same for g, 1, x, and y. And then here by you know, the possible monomials. And so, you know, when I look at degree 2d minus 1, that's basically, I am looking at monomials of uh, degree 3 and less. And I put my basis b at the end. So I basically get this matrix right here. And this first part is a 6 by 6 matrix. I call that m1. And then m2 is this part right here. And then it turns out that because we're in this generic situation, this first matrix is invertible. So I just multiply through, and I get this matrix. <clears throat> but what's nice is that, and of course, this makes this really nice because you know, the whole point of this uh, multiplication is to put the identity there at the beginning. So that's really nice. And then I just get some stuff here. But the point is, is that from each of these, I actually know what uh, polynomial I'm dealing with because each column represents a monomial. So this 1 and minus 1, well, that's just x cubed minus x. You know, this 1 and minus 1, and that's x squared y minus y. So basically, in each case, I know exactly what the monomial is. And then the other thing that's actually more important is that, of course, when I multiply by the inverse matrix, well, 
Matrix multiplication corresponds to just a whole bunch of row operations. So I'm really just going from here to here. I'm just doing row operations on these guys to get that. So that means that these rows here are linear combinations of the rows here. So that means these guys are in the same ideal. So I'm generating some really interesting elements in the ideal just by pure linear algebra. So that's really nice. And, um, and, and then I, now I've highlighted some in red, and we'll see why. Because the, the ones in red are the ones that are exactly what we need to make things work. And so, so let's put them, because remember, our, my goal is to come up with some multiplication matrices. And I claim that the guys in red tell me exactly what to do. So, so, so let's work that out. So, so here are the ones that were in red. And now here's the way to think about what's going on. And so here's my monomial basis. And the ones that I've picked here, the red ones, are the ones that are right on the border of, the, of our order ideal. Now remember, if you look back, I also had this x cubed and a y cubed as leading terms. But see, they're, they're further away. So they're, they're not interesting. So it's really only these ones on the border that play a role. And now let's write down some multiplication matrices. And so the idea is that, you know, what I want to do is I, you know, I want to take my, uh, so here's the uh, basis B. Here I want to multiply it by X. Here I want to multiply it by Y. And I want to take this, express it in terms of that and the coefficients. And of course, multiplying by X, well, you know, multiplying by X takes me from the first basis element to the second, so I get something there. Now X squared is interesting, but that's one of these guys. And x squared, well, that's going to give 1 because that's in the ideal. And of course, so that's where that one comes from. Then of course, x, y, well, that's just another basis element. That's the fourth one, so that's why I get that there. And then of course, the x, x, y, that's x squared y. That's that, but that's an element in the ideal. And so that's just the same as y, which is the third basis element. And so I get the matrix multiplication just instantaneously. And this one works out equally easy. So this is really gorgeous. That all, you know, even though I've made a big deal about Grobner bases and all that stuff, in this generic situation, I don't need that. I can really just do this very simple thing. And what's happening is that lurking in the background, there's, there are Grobner bases lurking in the background. There are also more general things called border bases lurking in the background. So there's some very pretty mathematics uh, uh, connected with this. But now let's talk about the general case. So now let's talk about the case when f and g have degree d. And uh, so here we have this Macaulay matrix that has these two parts. And I'm going to play the same game where that's a square matrix. It turns out it's, in general, its uh, size is d squared plus d. You can work that out easily. And so when I multiply through, I get this. And then from this right here, I get all the information I need to actually compute mx and xy. So the procedure I described in that simple example works perfectly here. And then it turns out that, of course, I'm concerned about the condition numbers, because I'm going to find eigenvalues. I have to basically solve some system of linear equations. And so that I want to know how well conditioned are these matrices. And it turns out that the thing that really determines it is this right here. So the thing that's going to cause these to be possibly bad is I have to take this M1 and I have to invert it. And so the question is, you know, if I understand this condition number, that's going to tell me something about what's going on here. And so, so here's from the, 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 that paper of Tellen and Van Barrel, and they basically pick some random um, Fs and Gs for degrees between 1 and 20. So there's the degree, there's the condition number. and. Uh, these are not nice matrices. So, though, so basically when I do, when I get condition numbers like this and do the MX and X, MY, these are not matrices I want to find their eigenvalues. So it's, so, 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 so that's the problem is this beautiful process gives crappy matrices. So, so, so does it plateau at the end because you're, you're just approaching machine? And the answer is ask Simon. <laughs> is that what he said? Yeah, because other, I mean. That's right, you, you expect it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and, so, and, and so, so then the question is, what can you do better? And the answer is, what you've got to do is be more clever. So you want to do something before you do this operation. And, and so they, in their paper, they have an algorithm. And so what they do is they do some, uh, basically they do some linear algebra on this guy before 
we invert M1. And basically, so they do a, a, a QR type factorization. But the extra feature is that they use what are called optimal column pivots. So they also exchange some columns around to sort of make the pivots work best. And, uh, and then, and, but remember, the columns correspond to monomials. And so when you do these column pivots, all of a sudden you're moving around the monomials. And so the ones at the end, which is your original B, they get moved around. And so after this process, the, you get a different monomial basis B prime. And here's an example with a degree 10. So here's, you know, here's our beautiful order ideal. And again, this was you know, you know, all x to the i, y to the j, but basically degree bounded by uh, 9. And, uh, and so that's this gorgeous order ideal. And, and this is the one that gave really bad uh, uh, you know, condition numbers. And here is a totally different kind of thing. This is the antithesis of an order ideal. And so, and so it's, you know, it's, still, you know, it's still a monomial basis. So there's 100 blue dots here, 100 blue dots there. But uh, you know, the structure is just totally different. And basically, it was picked by the algorithm. And yours here, we sort of had the systematic way to do it. But the thing is, this is going to give better condition numbers. And in their paper, oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, hey, order ideal, uh, not. And, uh, and so here's the uh, 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 illustration of the paper. So that's the condition numbers we saw before. But after we do this process, the condition numbers are much, much better behaved. And then. And then, of course, in each case, you can then actually try to uh, actually find the solutions. And, uh, and so, for example, you know, in each case, you could simultaneously diagonalize, and you get approximate solutions x, i, y. You can do it in both uh, this case and in that case. And then what you do is you try to measure how good is the solution. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to normalize f and g, because if f and g had gigantic coefficients, you know, that could mess this up. So you sort of like normalize them into like some L2 norm or something like that to have norm 1. So you normalize the coefficients, and then you just plug in and just see how big is this. So that's the residual. And so the idea is that, you know, because, you know, in, in the, if this is a perfect solution, of course, the residual would be 0. And, uh, and, and so it turns out that what happens is that, you know, in, in this poorly conditioned case, you know, your solutions, you know, sort of get worse and worse as the degree goes up. Whereas, um, in, uh, you know, when you have the better conditioned matrices, you just get better accurate, you know, your, your approximate solutions are actually closer to what you re regard as acceptable. So this is sort of the power of um, sort of doing some, you know, interesting linear, of doing some numerical linear algebra. And so even though sort of a classical approach is theoretically beautiful, if you're going to use linear algebra, you have to do something a bit different. And, and again, the, the, the big change is uh, you sort of have to, you have to abandon the, abandon the order ideal to really make it work. And so that's what this is evidence of. And like I say, if, if you want, you know, because again, this is the case where, you know, we're dealing with, uh, you know, basically, this is degree. So these are generic polynomials of this degree. And in uh, the, the poster that uh, Simon has is that basically it's still the case of n polynomials and n variables. But now instead of being generic of uh, total degree, they basically they have the same Newton uh, polytope and are generic within that polytope. And so that's the, the, the setup that they work with in that paper. So, so is that a correct? They might have different. Well, they might have different. Oh, that'd be even better. <laughs> so, that, so, that, so that really is more like the, 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 the typical sparse case that, that people like to work. So, so that's excellent. So that's the end of that story. And so that, that's, I think that's one really pretty sort of way in which the sort of numerical linear algebra interacts with the algebraic geometry. Now, the next story is the algebraic oil. And so this is a collaboration between Shell International and the universities of Passau and Genoa. So uh, Martin Kreutzer is at Passau, Lorenzo Robiano is at Genoa. If you've ever had anything to do with Cocoa, you know, you know that they are some of the leading lights of that. They've written this two-volume uh, book uh, that really is a commutative algebra done through Cocoa. But they uh, worked with uh, somebody at Shell named uh, Matthew. So David, what's Cocoa? It's a, it's a symbolic computation uh, package. It's sort of like Macaulay, too. And, uh, 
And, uh, and they worked with somebody named Henny Police, who's a mathematician that works for Shell. So it was really a, 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 a collaboration between industry and, uh, and academia. And also, like, there was another uh, uh, person from uh, Shell who actually went and did a PhD with uh, uh, Kreutzer. And, and so, they, they, you know, they've been done some work on this. So here's sort of one situation. Um, so you might have you know, an oil well, and there might be some oil here and some oil here. And, uh, and, and then you drill down, and so you found some oil, then you found some gunk, then you found some oil. And, and, so, and then what happens is you put in some valves, so those are valves. And so the idea is that you can, uh, you can, you know, you know what the valve, you control the valve position, so you know what that is. Uh, then you get some pressure drops across the valves. Then you also get the, the pressure drop um, from here to here. You get the pressure loss from here to here. And also you get some gas coming out. The thing you're actually interested in is oil, but you also get some gas coming out. And so what you get is you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven quantities. So you have these variables. And what you want to do is you want to basically find some monomials in these uh, variables and some constants so that from this I can basically predict the oil production. So that's the, you know, I'm interested in oil and I want this algebraic thing that's going to try to give me the oil. And what happens is that in practice, Nobody knows anything about what's really going on. This is sort of, uh, you know, a, this is sort of wishful thinking because the, the, the underground is a very complicated gadget, and, uh, and and so so it's very hard to make an actual model. And so, for example, you don't really have intrinsic choices for what these monomials are. You don't have any idea in advance what they should be. And so, so what's a way to to try to do this? Well, suppose I have some data. And so, so here, imagine that we have 5,500 data measurements. And so each data measurement is a recording of those seven variables. And so I have 5,500 points in seven dimensional space. And then for each one of those data points, I also have the corresponding oil production. So I simply want to get algebraically from you know, you know, these data points to the oil production. And I want some sort of nice polynomial that's going to you know, model that. And so one way to do it is I could simply take you know, this set of finite points, I could look at its vanishing ideal in the polynomial ring, and it turns out that there's the classic uh, algorithm of Buchberger and Muller that uh, basically, uh, you know, once you fix a monomial order, it gives an algorithm for actually computing uh, that ideal. And, and then what happens is that then this uh, quotient ring right here will have a basis and it'll be, f because there's 5,500 points, uh, you'll get 5,500 monomials. And then what happens is that then what you can do is you can basically take, you know, this, this is sort of, you know, classic interpolation. You can certainly find some monomial in, in these variables that at these 5,500 points takes on that data. So you just pick anybody, and it might be just god-awful and terrible and whatnot. But then you take its remainder on division by this Grobner basis, and then you express it in terms of these monomials. So what I found is um, basically, so I found monomials, and I found constants, and it fits the production data perfectly. So you say, oh, problem solved. We can go home. And of course, this is just terrible, just awful. Because first of all, they're remote, not remotely intrinsic. They depend on whatever monomial order they picked. But the other thing is that this is way too complicated. This is a classic example of what you call overfitting. You know, you basically take the data and make the data equal to your model. And, you know, that's called, like, cheating. And, um, and, and so you want something that does a, you, you don't need, you don't want 5,500 monomials to sort of model this stuff. You want something simpler. And yet you have no idea what to do. And so the question is, how can you come up with some numerical method to help you? And so that's what this project was about, is trying, because again, you see, here I'm in the land of exact arithmetic. So now when you go over to approximate arithmetic, is where you try to do things. Now here I have to do a caveat, is that normally when I give a talk, I more or less know what I'm talking about. Not entirely, but you know, I'm, I'm good at covering. And uh, in this case, I'm actually really on thin ice with this stuff. I've read the papers a couple of times. I do not understand what's going on. And, and so the one thing I promise is when I write the book, I'm going to actually dig into this and try to figure out what's really going on in a careful way. So I'm going to say some really vague, hand-wavy things. And if you ask me a question, I will simply continue to wave my hands. <laughs> <laughs> and so the idea is that. Um, 
you know, so if I take any uh, polynomial, then you know I can take that polynomial and evaluate it at my 5,500 points, and uh, and then what they came up with is. So they have two versions of this approach, and uh, one is an approximate bookberger muller algorithm, and the other is an approximate vanishing ideal. And the approximate bookberger muller algorithm, so what they want, they want an order ideal. So they actually want the structure on the monomials that's nice, but they're going to, in this particular case, they could actually get away with just 31. So instead of 5,500, it's down to 31, that's more reasonable. And then what happens is that when you take, uh, these monomials and evaluate them at the data points, well, roughly what's going to happen is you want them to be approximately linear independent. So you have to define carefully what that means. And you also want them to basically, when I sort of you know, do all possible ones, I want them to approximately span that. So you have to give definitions of what all that means. And so then you get uh, ba basically uh, you know, these guys right here, and this will be basically 31 approximately linearly independent polynomials, and so then I take my production data and I just do an orthogonal projection. And that's actually typical of what you actually do, you know, like when you do least squares uh, of any sort, is that, you know, you basically have, you know, some sort of, you know, subspace of model data, and then you take your actual data and project it onto it. And so we're doing that classic thing. So the idea is that, you know, by this approximate bookberger muller algorithm sort of enables you to focus on a very small dimensional vector space that, you know, sort of has what you want. And then what you do is that you then take, and so this guy, so here's P, here's the projected point, which would be some linear combination of these guys, and you declare it success if this uh, amount is true within whatever tolerance uh, that you uh, have, have picked. And then basically your model is then the oil production is given by this thing right here. And there's, and basically in this case, you know, we now have 31 things and so we avoided the overfitting thing. And so this is a possible way to approach things. Now it turns out that uh, the way they implement this approximate bookberger muller one, it's uh, similar to the previous lecture in that you sort of, instead of just working with matrices, you use some of the tools. In the previous lecture I talked about the QR algorithm. In this case, what they do is they apply a SVD, singular value decomposition, and they basically have an iteratively constructed Macaulay style matrix. So it has some things in common with some of the previous stuff and they do this. But it turns out that they have a couple of approaches. And so besides this uh, approximate bookberger muller they also have what they call an approximate vanishing ideal. And this is where I get really fuzzy. And, uh, and so this was, uh, so it's introduced by Kreutzer and uh, Police. Uh, remember, he, he's the one at Passau and he's the one at Shell. And, uh, and here's some of their you know, co-authors in 2009. So the idea is that uh, what I want is uh, I, I have this finite set and a tolerance. So an ideal is, an epsilon approximate vanishing ideal, provided I has a finite set of generators such that uh, you know, my, I want my generators to be normalized, and then when I you know, evaluate the generators at the, at the points, so th these are the points of X, I want that you know, less than or equal to my tolerance. And so that looks pretty okay, except that what happens is that it's hard to think classically because in fact, the generators of one of these things, they usually generate the unit ideal. Because if you think about it, if you take some polynomial with fuzzy coefficients and you take something else with fuzzy coefficients, they could be very small and their difference could be 0.1. So if 0.1 is in your ideal, then you're the whole thing, algebraically. So, so you have to sort of back off from thinking in a standard algebraic approach. So like I say, this, this is where I have trouble sort of you know, wrapping my head around this stuff. So to finish off, the way to think about it is I've done two pretty substantial examples of trying to sort of combine some of this wonderful uh, linear algebra, algebraic geometry with some of the numerical methods. And uh, what we saw in the first example is that I could use traditional notions of algebra. I had ideals, I had quotient rings, all that stuff, very, very nice. But in order to work with it effectively, I had to use a very different kind of basis. I couldn't use the uh, uh, order ideal, so I had decided to move outside of the, the, the realm of standard things in that way. In the second example, I actually did use a very traditional kind of monomial basis. It was an order ideal, so it was, in that sense it was a very nice object. But then I had these approximate vanishing ideals, which 
I can't really think of as a traditional ideal because then it's just the unit ideal. And for the unit ideal, everything is boring if you think classically. And so you have to think differently, which I'm not there yet. But anyway, what it points out is that you know, there is a beautiful interaction between numerical linear algebra and algebraic geometry, but it requires you to do things slightly differently. And so, so that's pretty much what I'm going to say for today, for this lecture. And so what I'm going to do in the next lecture is use a completely different paradigm, the homotopic continuation, and then we will uh, use that to have some fun solving uh, polynomial systems. So thank you. Questions? So, I guess the, uh, in the last example, the, the, in the paper, I'm assuming that there would be some sort of comparison to what if they use the standard data for the method. And, and you, you mentioned least squares, right? So, this is something that all over your algebra students learn. So, how did, how did their uh, approach compare to And the answer is, I, I, I so forget. I mean, that's something that. Or, or, I mean, again, you said you were studying on Finis, so I'll go out of nowhere and say something like, I mean, what's flavor of machine learning, right? So yeah, yeah. All sorts of, and, and we're interested in this because this is in our wheelhouse, right? Right, right. right. Of, of commuted algebra, 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 algebra. Right, right, right. There's, I mean, the, the sort of notion of having, you know, a big data set right, of right. outcomes plays right into the machine learning. Yeah, yeah. Sure. and so I, I don't know if that. Maybe a word or two about some place down the line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so That's I don't know if they've appro thought about yeah. other approaches to this yeah. stuff. I bet you now they apply machine learning. I'm sure yeah, they yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't, is Alvary Bowe still going on? It's a, so, so uh, police uh, actually had some e email correspondence with Henny Police uh, recently and said they have some sort of new work coming out. And, and so I, I'll certainly want to look at that, you know, in doing the write up of this. And so, you know, it's possible that this is sort of a very preliminary stage and it's possible they've sort of evolved beyond that. Like I said, there was also a, a PhD student that worked with Kreutzer and he like wrote a 200 page thesis on some of this stuff, trying to really sort out what stuff. And he got his degree with them and then went back to work for Shell. Yeah, but they work with that. Like, like, I think there's some postdocs that are on this for, for a few years. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of yeah, yeah. Knowledge. And like I say, police is still working on aspects of it. And so I, I, you know, he says he has a paper in the works. And so when I get that paper, I'll have a better sense of sort of what, what the current state of the art is. So any other questions? So, so let's go get some coffee. <laughs>